So, um, yeah, I'm Claire Annesley. I'm a professor at the University of, of Sussex, and I'm the institutional lead for um, promoting um, equality, diversity, and inclusion at the university. And today, together with um, Daniel Hayash, who's a, a physicist and a doctoral researcher in human um, computer interaction at Sussex, we're going to, and um, what we'd like to do is share with you the approach that we're taking at Sussex um, to try and build inclusive um, STEM. So, you know, we're, what we're here at this conference, there's loads of amazing stuff going on, um, really important initiatives in academia and industry to tackle inequality in STEM tack, um, and to promote diversity in STEM. And what we're trying to do is really create um, that inclusive um, environment where everybody can thrive and everybody can succeed. And we think to create a genuinely inclusive STEM, um, there's four things that uh, we at Sussex are focusing on to try and make that change within our own organisation. Um, the four things are, we think that, first of all, we need to go through a process of thorough institutional and cultural change um, to make universities and industries more inclusive. Secondly, um, we think that we have to be really, um, make the effort to address all inequalities um, that exist um, within STEM and also be very clear and understand um, how those inequalities intersect, intersect to create multiple disadvantage. Um, thirdly, our approach is to make sure that equality and diversity is everybody's business. In the, one of the presentations this morning, there was the question about well, if we get more women onto, onto uh, panels um, to select grants, you know, we're, the, there's more workload on those women. So it's about making sure it's everybody's business. And finally, um, the fourth um, thing that we'd like to focus on in our talk today is about using our own brain power to try and drive forward those innovative solutions to um, create inclusive um, STEM and Daniel um, would like to um, introduce to you the, the innovation that, that he has um, come up with to promote inclusive um, STEM. So let me start with um, cultural change. What we often see uh, are that solutions to addressing inequality in STEM are about trying to boost the capacity of of individuals or thinking very much about focusing on those, um, you know, boosting the capacity or the presence of those who are underrepresented in um, a particular community. But what that is doing is still trying to, um, to boost those people within the constraints of the existing structures and the existing cultures. And I think there's a major flaw with this. We often hear back from um, scientists with caring responsibilities or scientists um, or scholars who are living with disabilities that actually these existing structures just don't work for them. They need um, more flexibility. Um, or we hear about, we still hear, and you know, this week um, we've had quite a, been conscious of quite a lot of stories that have um, come across my, my Twitter feed about cultures in STEM that are best um, alienating or exhausting or at worst abusive. And here I'm talking about power structures um, or networks that are dominated by one particular group or cultures of bullying and harassment that um, sometimes come with um, established power dynamics. And I think lots of us in this room are keen to challenge. So, you know, here we need cultural change to uh, challenge these kind of abuses of power um, where we find them, where they um, exist. So, you know, at the University of Sussex, we've started the process of trying to address this really important cultural change to challenge these structures and cultures and develop a more um, inclusive um, campus. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we've done um, over the last couple of years is introduce new policies to tackle violence on campus, including sexual violence, and we've introduced a new um, policy on staff-student relationships and staff-staff relationships with a particular focus on understanding the power dynamics within those kind of relationships and making sure that they are at least discouraged and also <laughs> exposed where they do exist. Um, and the other thing that we've done, which I wanted to share with you, is um, that we commissioned um, a project called the Changing Universities Culture Project, um, which is led by a Sussex-based um, sociologist called Professor um, Alison Phipps. Um, and this project con conducts a, a sort of a deep dive analysis, um, investigation 
of um, institutional cultures at universities. And the first um, Changing Universities Culture project, or Chuckle as it's referred to, was conducted at Imperial College in London. Um, and what it involves is a, a university-wide survey, um, followed by in-depth interviews, followed by focus groups, followed by an anonymous um, WordPress blog. And then following on from that, through, after the first kind of level of analysis, um, um, an analysis of the key themes that, are, um, that emerge from the early stages of the research, um, which are then explored in more detail through action um, inquiry cycles. Um, so we did this at the University of Sussex, um, and the report was published earlier this year. And so our hope is that, armed with this kind of deep understanding of our own institutional culture, the good sides of it and the, the, the less good sides of it, we can you know, work systematically to understand what needs to change within um, our own institution to make it more um, inclusive. One concrete thing that we've done already to address um, some of the issues that came out of that cultural survey was um, to commit the university to becoming flexible by default. And what we mean by this is that um, all of um, everybody who works in the university will have um, access to flexible working arrangements. The default position will be that we say yes to flexible working rather than saying no or maybe or it being sort of applied patchily across the institution. And we think this is really important for people with caring responsibilities, people living with disabilities, um, empowering the um, people to work in a way that allows them to have control over their work, um, manage their physical and mental health, and recognises caring and responsibilities, and encourages wider um, personal development to make them better um, scholars. The next thing that I flagged in the process of creating inclusive STEM is to think about um, making sure that we address all inequalities. So gender equality in STEM, gen sorry, gender inequality in STEM has rightly received an awful um, lot of atten um, attention. And there's still, without doubt, a lot more that needs to be done to really cr create a genuinely level playing field between male and female scientists in academia and industry. But at the same time, I think it's really important that our attention also turns to other groups who are underrepresented um, or under the radar in STEM. And we need to um, be very alert to the need to promote race equality, raise the visibility of LGBT um, plus colleagues, empower STEM colleagues who are living with disabilities, and understand how these multiple identities um, intersect. So our view is that you, know, you have to see it to be it. And so we do quite a lot of work to raise the profile um, of um, uh, um, and role models of scientists who belong to um, different underrepresented groups um, and, and really working very hard to change the idea um, within our community but also in the wider community and with young people in particular um, about what a scientist um, looks like and some of my colleagues who are here today, um, Katie and Snarley, um, work very hard on these kind of initiatives. So let me give you um, some quick examples of the kind of things that we're doing. Um, we have a project called Robo Gals, which is a, a kind of a society that's run to promote um, female participation in STEM-related subjects, particularly in engineering. And the idea there is to inspire local students to pursue STEM subjects through fun and engaging workshops. Um, we recently have run a series of events for L to promote LGBT um, plus um, scholars. So we have an out and about project um, that Katie from our team has initiated. And earlier this year, we held our first LGBT plus STEM day, which was really about celebrating the contributions of LGBT plus scholars um, and also ensuring that they have a safe place um, in science. And then this year, at the moment in the UK, it's Black History Month. And um, next week, we're going to be running um, an event um, on life sciences careers to celebrate the careers of black and minority ethnic um, scholars and to kind of showcase the diversity of careers that, that exist. And the speakers will be talking about um, their roots to their current positions as well as giving an overview of what their roles entail. So please, we have a stand outside um, uh, where the tea and coffee is, so please do come and join us and find out a little bit more about these kind of initiatives and others that we have um, going. Um, the next thing that I wanted to 
flag is a kind of really important principle um, that we hold dear, which is that equality or, or promoting inclusive um, STEM is everybody's business. Um, it's, uh, you know, we call on everybody to think about what they can do, no matter how big or small, to create this inclusive campus that we're aspiring to do, um, to create. We, the burden should definitely not fall on those who are um, underrepresented in, um, in our community, nor should the very small number of allies, or even the large number of allies, carry all, out all of the necessary work. You know, everybody has to be, um, hold, carry some of the responsibility and the capacity to promote a project of making STEM uh, more inclusive. And that's really the message that we're trying to spread across um, the University of Sussex. There's a number of ways that we can do this. And one of them, um, which leads me on to my final point before I hand over to Daniel, is to think about you know, people's brain power. Um, you know, we're all in the business of creating knowledge um, and innovating for a better world. And we, you know, we have the solutions to um, inclusive STEM in our brains, at our fingertips. And so what we're trying to urge people to do is to use their innovative capacities to try to create a more inclusive STEM. And this is exactly what Daniel has done with his um, innovative um, Iris Graphil project. And um, this is the point at which I hand over to Daniel. Yes, thank you very much, Claire, and good afternoon. Um, so when I was losing my sight, I've been told two things. One of them being, you will go blind. And the other one being, studying sciences will be difficult. Do humanities instead, maybe. And whilst I was ready to lose my sight, I wasn't quite ready to give up my curiosity on uh, how nature works. And true, that was very difficult, because um, imagine um, the situation where my mathematics assignment says, plot the graph of a sine uh, and a cosine function, and then comment on the differences. Well, I can do that easily, no problem, uh, with uh, the help of tools like uh, MATLAB or Python, which use commands instead of a graphical interface. But then there are two issues. How do I know that I actually get what I wanted? And secondly, how do I compare the visual results? Sure, I could use a tactile embosser, but is this the best user experience I can get? Will I not face any frustrations? And I can tell you, I did. So this is a situation which is a real life story from um, my first year as a blind science undergraduate. Uh, the, the amount of time you spend on, uh, on uh, trying to find funding for bulk equipment, trying to do the training, and of course the troubleshooting with such hardware, all because I needed a few quick descriptions. So descriptions of scientific figures, but where can I get them? Where could I get those? If I needed to know the color of my shirt I'm wearing, I could um, borrow essentially the eyes of people. Over a million of sighted volunteers from different online communities such as Be My Eyes are at hand and ready to help with simple tasks like that. Else, if um, astronomers take a million photographs of galaxies. There are um, crowds of volunteers and science enthusiasts who are again ready to help and classify these images contributing to research. And this is what we call citizen science. Now today I would like to talk about something that sits between services like Be My Eyes and citizen science. And that's Graphile Iris. So IRIS is an interface. It's a communication channel to ask for and to offer support. It's essentially an application which is connecting blind and visually impaired students to a network of expert volunteers such that they can ask um, for specialized help. To give an example, a student can upload an image from the course, which is then sent to a, a trained volunteer they would write a subject-specific description. Now then, this is returned to the student in a fully accessible form, of course, making sure that nobody is left in the dark. When describing STEM content, it's very important that we have a context behind it. 
And that's why we need trained volunteers. These are the people who have the necessary skills to set the context and also put them in the right words. So Iris is ready to start helping people since July this year. And also, this is the time where we need to get um, more feedback on what new features to add and what uh, barriers, what frustrations to remove. So our task is now really to build the community behind uh, Iris who would write the image descriptions. Who is benefiting from Iris? Well, of course, uh, anybody who is curious and has a sight loss, but who should use Iris? Again, uh, visually impaired students, of course. But I also believe that um, an inclusive STEM also means an inclusive community. It's us scientists and researchers and academics who should provide the tools to uh, welcome people with a diverse set of abilities. It's not the students like myself or the library support workers who should um, ask for adoptions all the time. It's the schools, it's the publishers, it's the online course providers who should make uh, on-demand accessibility out of the box. So how do we actually recruit this community? We know that digital recruitment is not effective enough. We need ambassadors who act as role models of image describers and who can engage with their local community to join the Iris community. And, um, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, basically, the uh, stand we, Claire mentioned outside, uh, we set up um, iPads where the Graphile Iris is already loaded on it. So we invite everybody to spend just a couple of minutes of time and see yourself how easy it is to upload an image and then write yourself an image description. So you can see that with just a few minutes of support, there are a few hours of frustrations that we can uh, possibly avoid. And of course, the larger the community, the less work it will be for members to to um, support the people who need it. So if you are uh, liking what uh, we are proposing there, if you like the actual project, we would be very keen to welcome people and commit uh, as an ambassador just by giving your name, your contact details, so we can start on individual basis, work out what, what's the best uh, strategy for different organizations, different schools to bring this community together and also to help their students. So in a nutshell, with your help, our vision can become a shared vision. And just to summarize, how do we envisage building an inclusive uh, um, STEM? Well, as Claire said, through considering all inequalities, and through striving for cultural change. A culture where the STEM community, not the disabled community, not the women, not the LGBT community, not the academics only, but the entire STEM community says it's everyone's, it's our business. A culture where we can use our brain power and innovation to provide support for each other. And there are and there will be other projects to achieve this. But today, I would like to invite you to uh, try Iris, to share your eyesight, to share your brain power, to spread the word in your local community and beyond, and to share our vision. And with this, I thank you for your attention. And of course, we take any questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, that was wonderful. Other, we'll ask for questions, and by the time the microphone gets, I just want to say one thing. So you started with this idea of cultural change, and I thought, oh, these people, they want to change the world. <laughs> and you got to <laughs> a point where you actually practically have changed the world for those people who use this program. So it's a <laughs> like the best metaphor. But yes, well, I, like to, I, I usually like to say that I don't want to, or we don't want to change the whole world, you know, yes. just only a part of it, and that's enough. Well, that's, uh, that's the whole world to some people, though. That's incredible. Sure.
I, don't, and I, I mean, you're yes. right. I think it's really important. If you have a big vision of cultural change, you have to think about the very small or very concrete things that you can change along the way. Yeah. And just to give a really kind of very simple and often seems kind of quite a petty example at the University of Sussex, we have a massive problem with parking. It's a small campus, there's too many cars. And people with caring responsibilities, they would drop their kids at school. By the time they got to campus, there would be no parking left for them. And this was kind of really disruptive, really stressful. And so we created a pool of parking spaces that were reserved for these particular colleagues. And you know, it's one of the things that we've done that has created the most positive feedback. So we're always looking for the quick wins, low-hanging fruit, yeah. you know, and the, the, the really innovative projects, as well as, um, as small steps toward changing the bigger culture. And it's evidence that it works, too. I mean, it's proof positive kind of thing. I do like that. Have we got any questions? <laughs> I think they're also stunned. Well, I think we, we can spend this time, they can come and sign up. <laughs> oh, yeah, true. So there is a, <laughs> oh, we have two questions. No, I think it's one there, and then next to that, yes. Okay, thanks. Just, you know, thank you for the presentation. I'm really intrigued with this. It's just, you know, it just uh, opens the world for so many people. But uh, in terms of, what are the blockers in terms of financials and, you know, funding models? It sounds like it's a very expensive area to go to. So. Is this something that we need to put extra support or help in as a community and society? Yes, exactly. So in terms of Graphville Iris, um, this has been initially a student-led project three years ago. And then last year it got to the stage where we decided to actually uh, formally um, uh, organize a not-for-profit enterprise. And so far it's five um, postgraduates are in the team who are pushing it. And this is the time where we have built the, the product and where we are striving to build a community, but also where we realize that in order to keep it sustainable, this is the moment where we need to uh, look for uh, financial stability. And um, because the problem now is that all of us doing this um, in our spare time, um, which can be still quite a lot of hours, but um, if we think about long term, um, yeah, we do need social investment, we need uh, investment from the publishers, the different um, educational institutions to actually allow us to uh, sustain the service. Yeah. Thank you. And there's a, that woman there, uh, in the, to the right with the dark green jacket, and then on the edge. Hi, thanks very much. I'm Anne Webb. I'm from uh, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council in Canada. I just wondered if um, the project you're discussing, it sounds like it's, I mean, it would be accessible internationally and I guess potentially over time it could be available in more than one language. And I'm just wondering if you could say a bit about how you see things evolving. Yeah, absolutely. So we definitely aim this at an international level. So at the moment, um, we purely for logistical reasons and because of our uh, time constraints. We want to focus first on English-speaking uh, countries, but pretty much anybody who understands English uh, is welcome to sign up already at this point. And uh, purely just because I'm, I'm coming from Hungary and uh, we have uh, partners there um, in collaboration with the IT Foundation for Visually Impaired People, we already started discussing that they would help us uh, translate the whole uh, web interface and start help us um, building the community within Hungary. So that's uh, perfectly uh, reasonable that we could do in, in any other part of the world. Um, we just want to make sure that we do this um, in small intervals. So we first build up maybe an English speaking community just so that we can satisfy uh, their feedback uh, and then move on to more internationalization just so we don't uh, uh, over promise and under deliver. That makes sense. Was that okay? Yeah. Okay, question. Let's go to the next question. Hi, I'm Valeria Sinclair Chapman from Purdue University. I, I wanted to say I found um, both elements of this presentation incredibly inspiring, and this is why. Um, and maybe you can speak to how you actually made this work. But the reason why I found them inspiring is because um, 
I'm a bit of an impatient activist, right? And so, um, so we have a lot of conversation about, that's important, about um, uh, listening and slow change and incrementalism and all of these things. But neither, um, your conversation about um, making it a norm to have flexible work didn't sound incremental to me. And the, the push about the IRIS program also doesn't sound like an incremental change. So how is it that you moved from, uh, what was the, the mechanism, or how is it that you moved from what would typically be lots of conversation, and maybe there was lots of conversation that predated all of this, but into really concrete, um, maybe not so small, like the parking idea, right? So what made that work um, in the absence of persuasion, or was there this long tail that you just didn't talk about when we started with the change? It's a really, really good question because I very often find myself charting a course between um, you know, lots of people who are very impatient for change, um, which feels like it's a very long time coming, and a very you know, big hope for the type of change that we can, and then making sure that we're delivering on the way as we go. I think the change that happened was um, about two years ago, um, we had a new vice chancellor appointing to the University um, of Sussex. One of the first things that he did was tackle um, a big um, kind of controversial issue around, um, uh, that had happened on campus around um, a violent staff-student relationship. Um, and he was very open about um, you know, looking at that and, and wanting to address that. So there was a kind of an appetite for change. Um, he created a new post, which was my post, a Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor for Equality and Diversity. And the, one of the first things that I did in that role was um, try to kind of lobby for some resources around me so that I could have a team. Um, the lady sitting two seats in front of you is, is part of that team. And <laughs> You don't want to mess with Nicola. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we, we um, you know, together as a team, we've, we've been able to power forward with really, really kind of clear, doable initiatives. So thinking about what's really going to make a difference and then pushing forward to make sure that that gets, um, gets implemented. And sometimes it feels frustrating. Sometimes we feel like we're just doing one thing at a time. But I think that perpetual movement forward is better than, you know, promising the world and then not actually delivering anything. So. Um, it's, it's, so it's partly about leadership, I think it's partly about resources, it's partly about the great team and community that we've managed to create who all have that mindset of delivering as well as having the, um, the kind of the ambition for big, big change. Daniel, is there anything you would want to Yeah, maybe to if I just have a bit of time, just on yeah. the Graphil side. Um, so again, in, in our case it was um, just a bit of impatience and the belief that uh, the support uh, that is not necessarily available at the moment is something people need now and not in five or ten years' time. So, the, actually, how Graphil started was from an idea of developing a hardware device which can um, display tactile graphics in a ref refreshable way, similar to refreshable Braille text. But the problem was that this is five to ten years of research and development work, and we said, yeah, this is great, we can continue with this, but then what can we do within six months that people can use meantime? Maybe we cannot make them feel the diagrams themselves, which is very useful, but we can still do something almost or just as useful, such as uh, describing those diagrams, because depending on the scenario, it might be just as good. And um, yeah, we just said, no, well, we need, people need access to scientific graphs, so let's give it to them. Let's build something uh, we can actually do within uh, our limited resources, limited time. So that was uh, one of the uh, inspiration. Yeah. Great, right, thank you. We're just going to another question. And that should be the last one, I think. Uh, Ella Kors from, from Norway, um, from the Committee for Gender Balance and um, Diversity in Research. Um, I'd like to speak about the, um, the description up here, which is uh, about building ex inclusive STEM. Um, and where you speak of uh, simultaneously trying to work with cultural change and working with all in inequalities um, and making it everyone's business, which uh, I totally agree to that you have to also do that, the, the last point, to, to make it everybody's business. But um, 
from our experience, one does meet a bit of resistance. Uh, <laughs> and there is a tendency to focus on one issue at the time. And one of the reasons is there's very different resources available uh, when working. There's different resources, different networks, um, different uh, levels of research. Uh, when you're talking about gender in STEM, div ethnic diversity in STEM, disability in STEM, or, or other, uh, uh, the question of uh, harassment, uh, whether sexual harassment or harassment of uh, marginalized people. So how do you handle the difference in resources uh, and attention given to these themes in your project? Well, within, the, within our institution, um, I think historically, the most of the focus has been on on gender equality, and we've been signed up to Athena Swan for um, for a long time. But in the UK, there are similar, um, you know, charter marks that are out there for race equality, for um, LGBT um, plus inclusion, um, for uh, disabilities as well. So the resources and the benchmarks and the um, support um, is out there. Um, I think the challenge within the institution is to make sure that all of these. Um, issues are dealt with um, evenly um, and that we um, make sure that the resources that we have internally are kind of shared across all of those institutions because, you know, that there is a risk that, you know, certain communities, so, for example, um, our, um, the people on campus, our co um, colleagues on campus who are living with um, disabilities, a lot of them don't self-declare. And so we don't actually know about them. So we don't actually know what kind of um, resource is there, although we know that there's a lot of um, uh, um, dissatisfaction amongst that community. So it's about making sure that we listen to the kind of silent voices as well as to um, the louder voices and making sure that we um, share those equalities. And then using the external accreditation and the external schemes to help structure our work and, and, and um, monitor our progress. Thank you, that was, thank you. Thank you. That was thank very good. Um, I think that's it, we're gonna have to move on to our next week, but thank you very much, that was very helpful.